As CEO of the successful brand management firm Turkel, Bruce has been creating and working with valuable brands for over 25 years. He has built the agency on the belief that marketing should be well designed, simple, and should make a client's products and services more valuable. Using the straightforward checklist, Bruce has worked with hundreds of clients, written thousands of headlines, and designed even more print ads, television spots, websites, and campaigns. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bruce Turkel. Good morning, everyone. I have to tell you how thrilled I am to be here. I do this a lot. Like most of you, I travel a lot, and I speak to lots and lots of audiences. But this morning, I get to speak to my people, because what we're all about is moving people. We are all about selling destinations, selling tourism, and selling travel. And so are you. We're all about getting people to get out of their lives and go experience something new and something different. But because I'm talking to my people, I got to talk honestly. I got to tell you the truth. And what I need to tell you pains me because we have a problem. We have a big problem. And you all need to learn how to deal with it if we're going to move on into the future. You know, we talked about traveling. Everyone's talking about traveling. And I know, I hear at every one of the drink sessions, every one of the meeting sessions, all the networking, we all talk about where we've been. And in the last couple of weeks, I've been to Barcelona, I've been to Madrid, I've been to San Diego, I've been to LA, I've been to New York, I've been to the Florida Keys, I've been to Central Florida. And here's the strange thing. In every place I have been, I've seen a Starbucks, a McDonald's, and a Barnes and & Noble. And then I came here and I saw a McDonald's, a Starbucks, and a Barnes and & Noble. When I was in San Diego, I saw a Starbucks on every corner. I think the largest Starbucks in the world is in San Diego. It's so big and it's so crowded that they have a Starbucks inside it. <laughs> but here's the problem. If everywhere you go is the same, why go anywhere? If everywhere you go is the same, why spend money? Why travel? I mean, we used to be the United States of America. It's arguable that we could become the United States of Generica. Everywhere you go is the same. And if our job is to add value, if our job is to make our clients' destinations, hotels, airlines, cruise lines more valuable, then really our job is to differentiate them. Now the good news is there is a solution for this problem, and the other good news is that this is not a new problem. This has been going on for a long time. And so what I want you to do is I want you to use a little bit of imagination because I want to take you on a trip. And I want to introduce you to a couple guys that are going to show you how you change this paradigm. And I've brought with me this magical invisible time machine that is also a molecular transporter. And there's one in each one of your chairs. So I want you to get in it, and you got to set the dials. We are going to Vienna, Austria. Set that on the dial. Come on now, I'm not making you hug your neighbors and do this, OK? <laughs> there you go. See, the guys up front know how to do it. That's why they're the leaders of this organization. Set the dial, Vienna, Austria. And then over there on the right, you'll see the time dial. Set that one for 1640, OK? And now, you've all watched American TV, you know what to do to go back in time, right? So do this with me. Okay. You guys did it for everybody. I want you to know. So here we are. We open the doors. We are in Vienna, Austria. It's 1648. And we're going to visit with a guy by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach. Have you all heard of him? Okay, I know it's early and you're low on caffeine. Yes! Okay, good. If you don't know who he is, make believe you do. Because you don't want your neighbor to know you don't know who Bach is, okay? So we're going to visit with Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, we don't know what he looks like, really, because we've never seen photographs of him, because cameras had not been invented then. However, we have seen the pictures, and we know that Johann Sebastian Bach was a short guy with that long gray wig, right? He wore that red velvet Eddie Munster suit with the knickers and the high white socks, and he used to wear the uh, pilgrim shoes with the little buckles on them. And we also know that Johann Sebastian Bach was a composer. 
He composed lots of music that you're very familiar with. But what you might not know is that his first job, he was not a composer, he was a piano teacher. Well, he wasn't actually a piano teacher because in 1648, pianos hadn't been invented. Johann Sebastian Bach was a spinet teacher. And a spinet, as far as I know, is a small piano, kind of like a harpsichord. And Johann Sebastian Bach wrote lots of spinet music for his students. His favorite student was his wife. And one of the pieces that he wrote for her was called Minuet in G. Now, have any of you taken piano lessons or played piano? Any of you have children or seen children who take piano lessons? Have any of you seen children? OK, well, if you have children or have met children who have taken piano lessons, you have heard Minuet in G. But I need to make sure you know it. And we were going to bring a piano on stage, but we thought, you know, that's kind of a big, big hassle, number one. And number two, I don't play piano. So instead, since a spinet is a miniature piano, I thought I would bring a miniature spinet, which I have in my pocket right here. And I'm going to play Minuet in G for you right now. And it goes like this. Everybody know Minuet and G, my torturous rendition notwithstanding? Okay. Now, with that in your minds, I want you to get back into the time machine, okay? Open the door, hop right back in, set the location dial for Vicksburg, Mississippi. Set the time dial for 1950. All right? You know what to do next, right? Come on. Very good. Open the doors. Here we are. We know we're here because it's hot. We are in the Delta, the home of American blues. We are going to meet with a guy by the name of Sonny Boy Williamson, my personal idol, Sonny Boy Williamson. Sonny Boy Williamson was about as different from Johann Sebastian Bach as you can be. Johann Sebastian Bach was short. Sonny Boy Williamson was six foot six. Johann Sebastian Bach wore that red velvet Eddie Munster suit. Uh, Sonny Boy Williamson had been to England. He loved English Taylor, and he wore an all-black English drape suit, a wool suit in the heat of the Delta. Um, Johann Sebastian Bach had that gray wig. Sonny Boy Williamson, he was a dude. He wore an English bowler cap. They were about as different as different could be. Sonny Boy Williamson was African-American. Johann Sebastian Bach was European. European. Um, they did have some similarities, though. They both had three names, Johann Sebastian Bach, Sonny Boy Williamson, and they both wrote music that was played by musicians later on or appropriated or stolen, or I think nowadays we call it sampled. Sonny Boy Williamson wrote songs that you know they were played by the Allman Brothers, by Eric Clapton, by lots of rock bands. Sonny Boy Williamson wrote a song called Peachy Tree, and it goes like this. <laughs> Those songs, like those two gentlemen, were about as different as they can be. And you're wondering, yeah, that's great, but what the heck does this have to do with me and with selling destinations? Well, here's the amazing thing about both those pieces of music. Minuet and G and Peachy Tree use the same notes. They use the same seven notes. If you saw the sound of, advi uh, sound of advice, if you saw the sound of music, you know them. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. Yeah, do, but that's an octave, right? Do, do. It's the same note. It's just eight steps higher. Every piece of Western music ever written uses the same seven notes. But it's just the order you put it in. It's the rhythm you do it with. It's the spin you put on it. It's the emphasis you put on it that creates pieces as different as an advertising slogan you might have heard on the radio this morning, as the psalms you sang in church or in temple last weekend. Every piece of Western music uses the same notes. And I have to say that when we sell destinations, every destination uses the same notes as well. That's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. 
We did an experiment in our office a couple weeks ago. We cut out, from all the travel magazines that we all read, we cut out the ads for every single North American destination we could find. We put them up on a big, big board on the wall, and we put a big, fat piece of duct tape over the logo. And you know what? You can't tell the difference between one or the other. Now, some of them do show a landmark. So if you see an ad that has the Statue of Liberty in it, you know where it is, right? It's Las Vegas. All of... Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. If you see the Eiffel Tower, it's Las Vegas. All of the ads are exactly the same. And they all use the same things. They all show a body of water. If you're lucky enough to be in Miami, you show the ocean. If you don't have an ocean, you show a lake. If you don't have a lake, you show a river. If you don't have a river, you show a pond or a stream. If you don't have a stream, you show a fountain. If you don't have a fountain, you show a swimming pool. They all show water. They all show participatory sports. Golf, tennis, or if it's a cold weather destination, you see skiing. Every single one. They all show shopping. Because let's face it, that's the new activity that people do when they travel. Every ad shows outdoor dining. I think it's because it says the community is warm and it's safe. They all show the same things. And I'm not going to embarrass any of you by asking you to put your hands up at this point and tell me if those things are in your ads. But every destination shows the same thing. The United States of generica. We are becoming so much like our neighbors that there's no reason to travel. And by the way, there's lots of reasons for that. If you've read The World is Flat, you know about globalization, you know about computerization, you know about MTV, you know about shopping centers, you know about franchises. I mean, nowadays, if you go to the Promenade in Santa Monica, or you go to Lincoln Road Mall on South Beach, or you go to Fifth Avenue, the stores are the same. So I ask you the question again, how do we differentiate our destinations? Well, the good news is, we have figured out how to do it. We have spent a lot of time working on this, and we've reduced it to seven simple points. And each of those seven points is only three words. And even though I have an art degree, I know that seven points and three words equals not that many words. So <laughs> there's not that much for you to write down or to memorize, or of course, you can go to our website, turkel.travel, and you can see it all spelled out for you. Seven points, three words. We call them brain darts. Simple, powerful messages. You throw them, boom, they hit in your consumer's head and inspire them to action. The first one, the most important one, as Bruce said in the introduction, if you take nothing away from this conference, these three words are what you have to remember. All about them. All about them. We are all so busy talking about ourselves that we forget that, as we learned last night from Amanda, consumers don't care about us. They care about themselves, all about them. And I'll give you an example. We did a project for Nike. And before we did the project, we did research to find out about the company. What we found is that, by the way, the company is not that old. They were formed in the late 70s. Phil Knight was a runner. He actually did create running shoes on his waffle iron, and he sold them out of the back of his car. But that didn't last very long. The company grew and grew and grew. And Nike did research to find out why people bought Nikes. And here's what they said. Well, I buy Nikes to exercise for athletic activity. And by the way, Nike said to them, well, when do you need to exercise? And come on, we all know it, right? Three times a week, 20 minutes a day, I have to get my heart rate 80%. Has anyone not heard that? Okay, so Nike said, you buy athletic shoes to exercise. You know you need to exercise. You hear it on television, radio, you read it in the newspaper, your doctor tells you about it. You know you need to exercise. How often do you exercise? And here's what people said. I don't exercise because... And the because is where it was customized. I don't exercise because I had to be here early in the morning because the session started at 8.15 and I had to get up and I had to do my hair. I don't exercise because after this I have to fly to another city because I have another presentation in front of another CN. I don't exercise because I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too rich, I'm too poor, I'm too healthy, I'm too sick, I'm too old, I'm too young. Everybody had a reason. And what did Nike say? Just three words also, and you all know it. Nike said, just do it. Right. They didn't say, just do it because we're cheaper, just do it because we have hexalite construction, just do it because we have um, any of this special technology. They said, just do it. They sounded like my papa, hi. It's all right. 
not to worry, just do it. Now, at the same, oh, you knew him? <laughs> at the same time, Reebok had a tagline. Does anybody remember Reebok's tagline? Which makes my point, doesn't it? <laughs> Reebok said, life is short, play hard. Life is short, play hard means you're gonna die, play hard. Before you do, get off your butt and go do something. So here you have Nike sounding like my papa, hi, it's a hi, just do it. And, um, and Reebok sounds like that coach you hated in junior high school. Is it any wonder why Nike became the largest selling brand of athletic apparel, not just in the world, but in the history of the world? But Nike's too smart to stop there. They continue to do research to find out when people exercise. And you know what they found out? 80% of Nike sold never, ever see athletic activity. <laughs> Which means what we're doing is we're just laying on the couch and we're just hitting the remote control, but we're wearing our Nikes. And guess what? That's okay with Nike. Because if you're wearing Nikes, you bought Nikes. Just do it. So we made our presentation to Nike, and when we got all done, this woman stands up. She's the international brand manager. And the international brand manager says, you know what? I never really understood the success of our company, but I do now. She said, we have $8 billion of revenue. That's how much stuff they sell and how much money they make. $8 billion. She says, but our cost of goods sold is a $1 billion. She says, that means we sell $1 billion of rubber and leather and canvas and nylon and $7 billion of swoosh. And when you market your destinations, you can sell all you want of hotel rooms, of ADR, of occupancy, of restaurants. You can sell attractions and you can sell lift. But the real way to add value is to sell the swoosh. All about them. Which leads us to point two, which is hearts, then minds. Hearts, then minds. Most of us sell minds, then hearts. When we sell our destinations, when we sell our hotels, when we sell our airlines, what do we talk about? We talk about room rates. We talk about size. We talk about square inches. We talk, or square feet. We talk about lift. We talk about miles of beaches, don't we? Or how many stores we have. All the intellectual things. But we haven't made an emotional connection. We haven't told people why they should want to be there. I'll give you an example from a destination. You heard from, from Bill Talbert that, that Miami is a client of ours. And after the horrors of 9-11, our business in Miami dropped off 60% overnight, like that. And nothing had happened to our infrastructure. Our infrastructure was fine. But people didn't have a reason that they wanted to be in Miami. And that's when we redid our marketing. We completely changed our branding. And we used these seven steps. And we made an emotional connection. We used to sell Miami as a need. It's cold here. I need to be warm. I'll go to Miami. We used to sell Miami as a need. I have a two-week vacation coming up. I need to go somewhere. We would tell you to come to Miami. The trouble is, once you get on an airplane, you can get off anywhere you want, and there's lots of beautiful, warm places you can go to. You don't have to come to Miami. So needs were no longer working. We changed it to a want. We made people want to come to Miami. By not selling Miami, ironically enough, as a tourist destination, we stopped doing that completely. We sold Miami as a fashion brand. Because let's face it, the fashion folks have figured out how to sell wants. None of us need another tie another shirt, or in the case of the women in the room, another pair of black shoes. You don't need it, but you want. See, she, she grabbed her heart and went, Ugh! that was the most horrible thing she's ever heard. I don't need another pair of shoes, but you don't need them. You want them. And when you see that incredibly sexy, fashionable, urban person in that urban setting, you know immediately that it's an ad for Giorgio Armani or Calvin Klein. When you see people on the horses with the ruffles or the surfboards at Nantucket or in a farm in Kentucky living that impossible private school life that we all wish, we, you know it's Ralph Lauren. 
They don't have to say anything. They don't have to tell you anything. And when you go buy the shirt with a little polo pony on it, you think or you feel somewhere deep inside you, you're getting a little bit of that lifestyle. We want fashion. And so we sold Miami as a fashion brand. We made it something you want. Our entire goal was when someone says, hey, where are you going on vacation this weekend? And the person responds, Miami. They go, ooh, oh, wow, Miami. We decided Miami was a catalog. You either come to show off what you got, which means your new clothes, your new tattoos, your new implants, your new dog, <laughs> or you come to see what other people have in their catalog. And it worked. It worked. All of a sudden, our ADR started climbing. And amazingly, our occupancy started climbing too. We, in March, we had the highest ADR and the highest occupancy in the country. You know what that means? Highest rev par. You know what that means? Profits. Happy hoteliers. It worked because we sell Miami as a fashion brand that, with an emotional connection. In your rooms, in the bags, there's one of the hotel publications, and I'm sorry, the meetings publications, and if you look inside, you'll see an insert that we did. And thanks to the, I gotta say, courageous leadership of Mr. Talbert, of Bill Talbert, and of Rolando Aido, the marketing director, and David Whitaker, who has since moved on to Toronto, but our friends there, they allow us to do this crazy stuff. They allow us to sell Miami as if it was Calvin Klein, as if it was Donna Karen, as if it was Tom Brown, and not as if it's another place to go lay on the beach. And because of that leadership, the destination has changed. Hearts, then minds. Which leads me to point three, make it simple. Make it simple. We are all so busy making things complicated. Yet the best destination advertising marketing, you can describe with one word. If I ask you about New York, you can say it with one word. Someone might say Broadway, someone might say Wall Street, someone might say Shea Stadium, but as soon as you say New York, you know what we're talking about. Big, biggest city, exciting, bustling, the Big Apple. If I say San Francisco, somebody might say the Bay, somebody might talk about the Golden Gate Bridge, but when I say San Francisco, you know what it stands for. If I say Las Vegas, somebody might say gambling, somebody might say drinking, somebody might say adultery, but we know what do you think stays there? Come on. They have niched sin, and specifically adultery. Doesn't mean you'll do it, intellectual, but you could. Emotional. It's no different than why we drive SUVs. How many of y'all drive SUVs? My wife has an SUV. We live in Miami. We have no mountains, no dirt roads, no rivers to ford, to cross. She doesn't have a ford. How many of y'all drive sports cars? I have one of those. We live in Miami. You can't go faster than 25 miles an hour in Miami. <laughs> but you could make it simple. And I'm going to show you an example of that. I need a little bit of uh, imagination again. And maybe even some participation. OK. These rectangles are incredibly different. This one is a piece of canvas that a painter is going to make, paint a painting on. This one is a block of marble that a sculptor is going to sculpt. What's the difference between the two? OK, I'll give you a hint. Um, paintings are not nearly as heavy as sculptures. If you drop a painting on your toe, no problem. How about another one? That's exactly correct. Paintings are two-dimensional. You have the vertical, and you have the horizontal. A good painter will make it look three-dimensional, but it's two-dimensional. A sculpture, on the other hand, is three-dimensional. What else? How about materials? Canvas, wood, paper, rock, stone, also wood, clay. That's right. That's right. You're adding to one and taking away from the other. The process of creating them is exactly opposite, if that's correct English. Exactly opposite. Painting, the painter takes the paintbrush, applies paint to the surface. If they are as talented as I am, you get the Mona Lisa with her enigmatic smile. Sculptor, on the other hand, 
takes a hammer and a chisel and removes things, don't they? So this, let's say this is a block of marble. The sculptor cuts that out, removes that part, maybe puts a hole in the middle, puts it on a little wood base, sells it to the Tate Gallery in London for $10 million. If you're Henry Moore, calls it mother and child. It's a great business. <laughs> the activity of creating them is opposite. One is additive, the other is subtractive. Most advertisers paint. They put everything they can think of into their ads because you wouldn't want to miss anything. So you take your ad and if, oh, I left my pen over here. You take your ad and you put a headline and then you put some copy and then of course a logo and then someone says, oh, don't forget, se habla espanol, oh, of course. So let's see, we'll put that in. And then we have to tell people, you know, we're open 24 hours a day. Okay, let's see, Starburst. And, you know, we have 4,700 locations. We ought to list them all. So. And before you know it, it's not an ad, it's an essay. And nobody's going to read it. I have a friend by the name of Gary, Gary Kleinman. He's a sculptor in Miami. I went to his house, and on his mantle, over his fireplace, Another odd thing to have in Miami. Over his fireplace, he has a, uh, he has a sculpture that he did of a, of a seagull, of a bird, carved from driftwood. And it is gorgeous. And it's tactile. You want to touch it. And so I said to Gary one day, I said, Gary, how did you, how, how did you figure out how to take this gnarly piece of, of um, driftwood and turn it into a seagull? How, how did you create that? He says, I didn't create it. The seagull was inside the wood, and it was my job to remove it, to free it. It was my destiny. Okay, so <laughs> after I dealt with that for a little bit, I backed out of the house slowly. But I did some reading, and what I found out is Gary didn't come up with that thought. That's something that sculptors have been saying for hundreds of years. And I could put you back in the time machine, but we could go back and visit with Michelangelo, Michelangelo, who carved the David out of that giant block of marble, Michelangelo said, I looked into the marble until the angel appeared. And then the story jumps to Paris, and I've heard it told about Picasso, I've heard it told about Rodin, um, but the story I heard was that one of their students walked into the studio, and in the studio, in the middle of the studio, is a big block of granite, a big rough rock. And Picasso, or Rodin, is standing next to the rock, and the student walks in and says to, well, of course, they said it in French, but I'll spare you. It's early. We'll do it in English. Um, says, to, says to Picasso, Master, what are you going to do with this giant rock? And Picasso says, I'm going to carve a lion. And the student walks all the way around the rock. Says, you're going to carve a lion from this rock, but... That's going to be so hard. How are you going to do it? And Picasso says, actually, it's very easy. All I have to do is take this hammer and take this chisel and remove everything that doesn't look like a lion. And when you create the brand for your destination, for your company, all you have to do is remove everything that doesn't look like a lion. You already know that the brand has to be all about them, so you can remove all the stuff that they don't care about. You already know that it needs to be emotional, not intellectual. So you can remove all the stuff that's not emotional. Remove everything that doesn't look like a lion. Make it simple. Which leads us to point four, which is make it quick. Which leads us to point five, which is make it yours. Make it yours. If we already talked about the fact that every brand uses the same, every destination rather, uses the same things to sell it, what are you going to own? What are you going to own that nobody else owns? If we talk about great brands, you will see very quickly that it's obvious that the best brands own something. They own something simple, quick, and emotional, certainly, but they own something. Volvo, what does Volvo stand for? 
Safety, one word, you all knew it. You notice nobody said cars? Everyone knows Volvos are all about safety. But let's look at some other car brands. In Germany, there are five car companies. There's Opel, there's Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Audi, and Volkswagen. They all manufacture exactly the same things. They all make cars. But if you, if you see the, um, the Mercedes C-Class, the Audi A4, the BMW 3 Series, the Volkswagen Passat, and the Opel Senator, they're all within an inch of each other in length, in width, in wheelbase. They all weigh about the same. If you get it in that sort of pewterish color, they all look the same. They have great stereos, leather seats, engines that go 100,000 miles without a tune-up. If you were inside one of them and you were blindfolded, and hopefully you weren't driving, <laughs> unless you live in Miami, in which case it doesn't matter, you couldn't tell the difference. You can't tell the difference between the cars, but, but the car companies need you to tell the difference, or like destinations, why would you buy one instead of the other? So what do they do? On the front grill between the headlights, they put a logo. And interestingly, they all use circles. Opal uses a lightning bolt. Their logo looks like that. Mercedes-Benz, we all know it, they use the peace sign. Their logo looks like that. But I told you I have an art degree, so I look at these from an art point of view. If you look at them geometrically, Opal divided their circle in halves. Mercedes-Benz divided their circle into thirds. BMW, the ultimate driving machine, they divided their circle into quarters. Volkswagen, well, they simply took the Mercedes-Benz logo and they flipped it over, and then they removed the vertical and they added a W. And then the designers from Audi came along. They didn't know what the heck to do. They said the hell with it. They just took the other guy's circles. <laughs> Even the logos are exactly the same. But the cars are very different, aren't they? Let's, let's pick one. Let's pick Mercedes. And if you guys would help me out here, what does a Mercedes stand for? Status, I heard, OK. What else? Wealth, good. Luxury. Anything else? Safety, OK. Okay, that's what we'll stick with. Status, expensive, luxurious, and safe, yes? Okay, now, let's look at BMWs. Are BMWs statusy? Sure. Are they expensive? Sure are. Luxurious? Of course. Are they safe? Absolutely. But BMWs stand for one more thing, don't they? That's right, speed, performance, sporty, okay. So they're plus sport. Now, here's where branding, building brands, gets really interesting and really exciting. Because don't look at those attributes as the attribute of the automobile. Look at those attributes as the attributes of the driver. Would you say that a Mercedes driver is status-oriented, affluent, luxurious? and maybe a bit conservative. And then if you look at the BMW driver, well, they're all those things, but they tend to be a little what? Younger, hipper, sportier. In fact, in the, in the marketing world, people who drive BMWs are called PDBs, which doesn't stand, ironically, for people driving BMWs, but it stands for people dressed in black. Because they're the ones in the all-black suits sucking their cheeks in and voguing. The brands, you have a BMW, don't you? <laughs> the brand becomes the badge. We used to say, you are what you eat. We now say, you are what you consume. People buy these products to tell the world who they are, to tell the world what they stand for. And people take vacations for the exact same reason. The place I go says something about me. 
If I tell someone that I'm going on vacation to South Beach, it says something very different than if I say I'm going to Branson, Missouri. Not good or bad, mind you, but different. Brands are how we identify ourselves. Think about it. Think about the products. Let's talk about technology for a minute. Everything, because of technology, gets smaller. But there's one thing that hasn't gotten small yet. But let me give you some examples. Cameras. When cameras were invented right after the Civil War, they were enormous. They carried them on those Conestoga wagons. The dark room was actually the camera itself. And then when you've seen those great pictures by Ansel Adams, he had that giant bellows camera with the big thing that would, that would explode for the light, right? And then there was the Brownie camera invented in the 20s, and then the Instamatic, and then smaller and smaller and smaller, until cameras now are the size of credit cards. How about mobile phones? Think about the first mobile phone you ever saw. Right? That's right. Most people say it's the brick, but Richard said it right. It's the one that was over your shoulder with the box and the curly wire, right? And you kind of needed like a husky dog to carry it for you. <laughs> then they invented the brick. Then the next one Motorola came out with was the mini brick that was that big. And then they got so small that now you have, they have names like Razor and Sliver. They get, and of course, all the jokes are that soon it'll be a microchip implanted somewhere in our, in our jaws. They get smaller and smaller and smaller. They get so small, in fact, that my, cat, my phone now can get the internet, and it's got a camera inside it, and it fits in my pocket. But one thing gets bigger and bigger, and it's the keys to these luxury cars. Do you remember in the 70s, keys were little flat pieces of metal that you could put, well, remember you could slide a key under the mat? You can't do that now or you'd reenact the princess and the pea. It would be like that. All these things in technology get smaller, keys get bigger. Why? One woman said to me, oh, it's because there's the alarm button in it. I said, again, in my phone, I have the internet, my address book, pictures of my kids, and a camera, and it's the size of a credit card. And to put an alarm button, it's got to get bigger? And someone else told me, no, no, no. It's so, you know, when you press the button, the light's flat. It tells you where your car is. Okay, first of all, if anybody believes that, here's what I want you to do. The next time you go on a trip, I want you to pull into the airport uh, parking lot, you know, park in the Dolphin or the Flamingo or Badger or Groundhog, wherever you want to park, but don't pay attention to where you are. Go on your trip. When you come back, walk into the airport and press the button. You ain't going to find your car. The reason the keys are so big is so they don't fit in your pocket. So they can put the big logo on it so you can show off the kind of car you drive. And the next time you go to a power lunch with your clients, Look and see what's in front of everybody at lunch. We call it the digital stack. You have your phone, you've got your PDA, your Blackberry, your sunglasses that have the big logo on them, and your car keys. And by the way, the reason the lights flash and the, uh, and the horn beeps when you see your car is not so you know it's your car. It's because the car is flirting with you. So you walk into the parking lot, you press the button, what does the car do? It flashes its lights, hey, here I am. You have a Jaguar, you're successful. We are what we drive. More importantly, we are what we consume. So what is it about your brand that makes people want to wear it as a badge? What is it about your brand that makes people want to brag about it? What is it about your brand that defines who the consumer is? Make it yours. Which leads us to point six, which is all five senses. All five senses. Most people think that marketing works based on two senses, what you see and what you hear. And so you watch television, you see it and hear it. Radio, you hear it. Internet, you see it and sometimes hear it. And print, you see it. But let's face it, we make decisions using all of our senses. We make decisions using our sense of smell, our sense of touch, and our sense of taste. And we make instant decisions using those senses because we don't pay a lot of attention to them. Think about the networking event you went to last night up on the roof, that beautiful vista. There was that great rock band, the House Rockers. There was great food. And you've all come here with an agenda. Everybody came to this session with the thought of meeting somebody who's going to do something for you, preferably business. It, it, it takes a little while, but you'll catch on. 
But you all came here with an agenda of meeting somebody. And you saw that person across the room, across that great rooftop, right? And you already planned what you were going to say to them. You're going to walk up to them and say, hi, my name is Bruce Turkel. Nice to meet you. I represent, and here's what I do, and I'm so, right? You had the whole thing worked out. And it was almost like that commercial where you could see them moving slow motion. And before long, you were face to face. You put your hand out, gave them a nice, what is it called, a web to web, firm handshake. And they handed you a wet, clammy fish. Right? You made an instant decision. The minute that little sweaty thing got in your hand, you went, Ew. And if that didn't do it, they were a close talker, and they had just eaten onions and Roquefort cheese. And that little white flecks are coming out. You didn't hear those flecks, you didn't, but we make decisions using all our senses. Now here's the good news. We are in a sensual business. We can incorporate senses. Every place we come from has a regional food. It is not McDonald's. Every place we come from has a regional beverage. It is not Starbucks. Every place we come from has something that smells special and good. Every place we come from has something that's, that uh, sounds good, whether it's a type of music or it's an accent. In Miami, it's Cuban coffee. It's the spells of coconut and mango on the beach. It's a Hispanic accent. There are things about Miami that smell and taste different, whether it's stone crabs or a Cuban sandwich. There are things about your destinations that smell and taste and feel different. Use them. If you're a Floridian, you'll understand this story. You know, we have the Florida Turnpike that runs right up the center of the state. It's almost like our spine. And every 45 miles or so, there are rest stops. And the rest stops are shared. You have the northbound lane, you have the southbound lane, and in the middle are the rest stops. And they share them. And what I figured out is that every other rest stop, they change the side of the bathrooms. In one, the, the, the men's room will be on this side and the women's room on the other. Then if you go to the next one, the women's room is on this side and the men's room is on the other. It never matters unless you really have to go. In which case, the bathroom you need is always on the opposite side. I think it's the seventh law of thermodynamics. It's actually the, uh, the law of jellied toast, which states that if you have a piece of toast with grape jelly on it and you drop it, the chance that it will land jelly side down is directly proportional to the price of the carpet. <laughs> so that same law of thermodynamics applies to the bathroom placement in Florida. The chance that the bathroom will be on the side you need is directly proportional to how bad you have to go to the bathroom. If you're stopping because someone else in the car has to go or because you had to get gas, you open the door and it's right there. If you're stopping because your back teeth are swimming and it's this or death, you open the door <laughs> And the bathroom you need is all the way over there. And by the way, in between are 800 children going to Epcot holding hands because they're doing the buddy system. <laughs> they are blocking you from getting to that bathroom. So one of the exits in, this, uh, in the turnpike is called Okahumpka. And Okahumpka is an Indian word that translated means the capacity of your bladder. Because there's no other reason to ever stop in Okahumka, I have to say. But it's, you know, the exact distance from Miami that you just can't drive anymore. And you know that because you see these expensive cars we talked about sitting in the lot there with the windows, doors open, idling. Because you know the person just drove up and dove out of the car. So if you have too much time on your hands and you don't have a life, you can spend some time in Okahumka, and you, it's actually kind of amusing. And you can watch it because the doors fly open and you see these men and women, but mostly men for some reason, run in with that telltale knees together stance. They come running in, they open the doors, and then they get this look of abject horror in their eyes. Why? Because the bathroom they need is all the way over there, and there are 800 kids with Epcot for Christ t-shirts on holding hands. And they know, I mean, this guy would kill his mother to get to the bathroom, so they're elbowing their way through the crowd. But all of a sudden, they smell something. Any Floridians want to take a guess what it is? It's not Lysol. Don't make any jokes like that. That's right. I heard someone say it. Say it again. Cinnamon. Cinnamon. Because right in the middle is a Cinnabon. And so from killing these little 
sweet little children, all of a sudden they go, <laughs> they smell the cinnamon and they look around and they see a Cinnabon and they go get in line. <laughs> and then they order the Cinnabon, which basically looks like a couch pillow, right? <laughs> Covered with icing. It comes in a, in a suitcase. And what do they get with it? Not just coffee. They get a grand latte soy double macchiato, or they get, you know, one of those 55 gallon drum big gulp Cokes. You don't need that much soda if you just got off the face of the sun. But it's because our sense of smell is so powerful that it will overcome our other senses. How many of you use the sense of smell in your branding? All five senses. Which brings us to point seven. And I kind of cheated because I told you all three words. This is only one word, but we say it three times. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Once you figure it out, once you remove everything that doesn't look like a lion, you say it over and over and over and over again. Which ironically does not give you the right to be repetitive. You have to come up with new creative ways of saying this same message, but you say it over and over and over and over again. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And so I will. The first point is all about them. Point two is hearts, then minds. Point three is make it simple. Point four, make it quick. Point five, make it yours. And point six, all five senses. Point seven, repeat, repeat, repeat. And so I will. Point one is all about them. <laughs> There's only one other thing that I want to talk to you about very, very quickly. And that is, I told you in the beginning how proud I was to be able to stand up and speak in front of my people. And we've pretty much talked about business. We've talked about the business of travel. We've talked about ADR, we've talked about occupancy, we've talked about how to boost RevPAR, we've talked about dollars. But there's got to be more to it than dollars. And I really believe that all of us who get people to travel are making the world a better place. To paraphrase Mark Twain, bigotry cannot stand in the eyes of travel. People who travel can no longer be close-minded bigots. And there's too much of that in the world, but because all of us get people to go out and see other places and meet other people, we make the world a better place. If you listen to NPR, you hear Rick Steves wrote travel books. Rick Steves says, there are forces in the world that want to dumb you down, that want to convince you that other people are different. Don't believe them. Go out and travel and see them for yourselves. Our friends at Royal Caribbean say, get out there. And we at our agency say, in three words, we move people. We move people to travel. But more importantly, we move people to understand that the world is one and that we're all in it together. And because of the work all of you do, tomorrow the world will be a better place than it is today. Thank you very much.